Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Welcome, everybody, to this episode of Into the Impossible with my guest, Dr. Delilah Gates. She is one of the world's experts in black hole physics and the mysteries of black holes, of which there are many. Delilah, tell me, what is your favorite, most fascinating thing about black holes? Uh, I think my favorite thing is that black holes are the only object we know about around which light can travel in circular orbit bound orbits. So there's this region around a black hole where if you could sit in it and aim a light ray just right, it would wind around the black hole and you would be able to then see the back of your head. <laughs> so I think that's pretty fascinating. In particular, this implies that there are actually, whenever you view a black hole, there are multiple images of the emission around it stacked on top of each other. That's just amazing to me. And who was the first person to really think about black holes that they could even, you know, possibly be conceived of, if not explored and studied? The first notion of a black hole actually came from way back in around 1783, when philosopher John Mitchell posited, what if you had a star that had such strong gravitational pull that the escape velocity from its surface was the speed of light or greater? And today we Obviously, when we hear that, we think, oh, he's describing an event horizon. But, of course, the idea didn't take off at the time. <laughs> so everyone was just like, okay, what? Do people really think that dark matter could be made up of black holes? That's something I get asked about quite frequently. Um, probably n not. I don't. I haven't followed the literature on this specific topic. But um, I think the idea more so is um, black holes can be made of ordinary matter, but certainly if there is dark matter, that you could also have black holes made of that matter as well. So I don't think, at least in general relativity, um, as described by like Einstein, Schwarzschild, and Kerr, um, the black hole, it's kind of agnostic what, what matter made up the black hole. So certainly if you have um, particles that you want to describe which make up this dark matter, it could, of course, form black holes. Black holes could also be formed of just the ordinary luminous matter as well. Tell me, what is a Kerr metric? What is a Schwarzschild metric? What does it mean? What is a metric? Einstein's equations tell us that, the, that gravity is really the curvature of space-time. And so in the equation, the mathematical object that describes the shape of the space-time is what we call the metric. So really, the metric is just the mathematical object that describes the shape of the space-time. Of course, Einstein's equations are very general, and you can throw in different shapes and see if they satisfy the equation. And so if you find a solution that satisfies the equation, then it could describe gravity in our world. There are particular solutions that describe different types of black holes that are often given the names of those who discovered them. So like you mentioned, Schwarzschild, the first uh, solution to Einstein's equations, which Einstein never expected there to be any solutions that one could write in closed form, <laughs> Schwarzschild did it very quickly. Uh, he described a non-spinning black hole that had no charge. And then since then, you can all, we've also come to know that there are solutions that describe black holes that can be spinning as well as charged, specifically the case of a non-charged but spinning black hole. This is the one we think describes the kinds of black holes that exist in our universe. You are moving from the venerable Harvard University down to Princeton University, where I understand that one of their predecessors there at Princeton, uh, John Archibald Wheeler, coined the term black hole way back when. And he also said something that black holes have no hair. What does that mean, black holes have no hair? So the idea that black holes have no hair really means that regardless of the matter that went into making them, if they were formed, say, from gravitational collapse, that they're only described by a few parameters. And for the black holes, this could be the mass, the rate at which it's rotating or spinning, um, and if it has an electrical charge. And that's it. They really captivate the imagination. And in fact, they have more paradoxes associated with them than almost anything, uh, one of which being the famous information paradox. I wonder, can you describe that? I know it's not something you necessarily work on, but people ask me about it all the time. Can you, can you say, is it really that important, this information loss paradox? And what is it, first of all? So in physics, um, even quantum mechanically, we believe that there's this idea of determinism, which means if you know what the, um, the physics are at one point of time, you can evolve forward or backwards in time 
uh, and still have enough information to describe the whole situation. The thing about black holes, at least described classically, is that because there are so few details about them, you can't really say once you've thrown everything into a black hole, collapsed a black hole, you can't really say anything about what formed the black hole. Further, in the 70s, Hawking came up with the idea that black holes should radiate. Um, and this radiation is thermal radiation. And as the black hole radiates, it slowly loses mass. Um, but because the radiation is just purely thermal, that means it carries no information about the mass that went, about the stuff that went into making the black hole uh, if it completely evaporates. And so this is the information paradox. How if a black hole eventually evaporates such that there's no, even behind the horizon that we couldn't access, but there's just, it's not there anymore. What happened to that information? And we can't reconstruct it from a thermal distribution of radiation like Hawking originally described. Uh, there are a couple proposed um, resolutions. It could be that black holes actually do have hair and there's fluctuations along the surfaces uh, that you would need to use quantum gravity to describe. It could also be that instead of completely evaporating, um, the black holes will start to evaporate, but then they'll leave a remnant behind. Um, and then finally, there are those people who say, maybe we should abandon the information conservation altogether. Another kind of paradoxical aspect of black holes that I hear a lot about is the so-called holographic principle that somehow black holes, because of their mysterious ability to in encode or encrypt their information via their surface area, what is the holographic principle? What does that mean? The, the holographic principle, it can really most readily be thought about when you think about entropy. So in general, we're used to describing, say, the entropy of a bunch of particles in a box as having to do with the volume of that box. But for black holes, the entropy isn't described by the volume, but just the surface area of the horizon. So it's really um, um, proportional to the, not the volume that the horizon would take up, um, or everything inside the horizon would take up, but just the, just the surface area of the horizon itself. Um, and so um, this is the holographic principle that really the, it's the idea that the physics, the entropy, the information is encoded um, on a, on a two-dimensional surface as opposed to in a volumetric way. So uh, it's kind of a hologram. Um, and this is a you know show for children, but I want to uh, that's friendly for children. It's not necessarily for children, but I want you to describe what is a naked singularity and keep it clean, Delilah. Please keep it clean. So, um, despite the scandalous name, um, a naked singularity is nothing untoward, but still something very mysterious and questionable in its own right. So, when we think about black holes, we think about this thing called an event horizon. Um, and this event horizon is this region from which we can no longer receive information. Once anything has passed the event horizon, um, it cannot escape back out to someone or send light even, which is the fastest thing we know that can move. It cannot send any information via light or anything back outside the horizon to someone on the other side. And so in black hole solutions described by general relativity, behind the horizon we have what's called a singularity. And this is a point where basically the curvature, at least described uh, in general relativity, appears to blow up. And it could be that there are singularities behind black hole event horizons, or we need to then move to really using a different description of the, uh, instead of just classical general relativity. Basically, as long as you have a horizon, you don't have to think too much about the singularity. But what if you don't have an event horizon. Well, if you don't have an event horizon, there would be this, just this point that if general relativity is correct, everything goes to mayhem, curvature blows up, and all this stuff, uh, crazy stuff happens near as you approach. Can you create black holes in the laboratory and a particle accelerator? Is that a danger? Is that a reality? Are they different than cosmic black holes? So we don't, at least in the energies we have with like uh, the LHC, the Large Hadron Collider, we cannot throw particles together with enough force to cause tiny black holes. Thank goodness. So we can't make literal black holes that way. But I will say there is an interesting uh, enterprise of trying to create analog black holes. These are tabletop systems using um, atoms or fluids that behave like black holes such that you could create little event horizons from which um, information in one part of the system can't go back to a region on the other side of that horizon and things like this. So there are there is a whole enterprise of trying to make tabletop 
analog black holes uh, that are tiny that we can see here on Earth and have a better handle on such that we can learn some things. Here's a question I asked Jan Eleven, who is one of my friends and heroes, um, and she, she answered it, but I'm not sure I understood it, so I'm going to ask you, what's a black hole made of? I, I thought you threw in all this matter, they eat it up, but they're just you know mass spin and charge. Describe them. So what are they made of? Ah, so <laughs> in general, in principle, in general, to me, they could be made of anything. Realistic black holes, though, are mostly made of the kind of matter that, that makes up our universe. They can come from gravitational collapse of a star, in which case they would really be made of the same stuff the star would have been made of. So really, they could be made of any any kind of matter we have in the universe. And, and those that uh, result from supernovas are certainly made of the stuff that was making up the star before it blew up. The last kind of question, oh, actually, second to last question just about black holes is, is cosmic censorship. Is that related to this information loss paradox? Or is that something different? So cosmic censorship is related to the naked singularity I mentioned. So like I said, if we don't have an event horizon, and we are still using general relativity to describe a space time that has a singularity, at the singularity, the curvature would blow up and things like this. And so even though we can analytically with math, we can describe this kind of situation, the cosmic censorship tells, conjecture tells us that we suspect, it's a, just a conjecture, so that it's not a hard proof mathematically yet, but we suspect that any configuration that we could describe with general relativity that would include a singularity has to have that singularity behind an event horizon. Another question I get frequently is, is our universe sort of inside a black hole? Could we en envision our universe either emerging from a white hole, a black hole? Yeah, we, we could be inside of a very large black hole. It could be everything in our universe is inside of the event horizon of a very, very, very big black hole that's bigger than our universe. The reason for this is one of the things we worry about when we cross a event horizon, you probably have heard about is spaghettification. As you get close to the black hole, the the change in the amount of gravity on the side of you closer to the black hole versus the side farther from the black hole would be so different that you would feel like you're being pulled apart. But it turns out the location of the event horizon depends on the size of the black hole. And if the black hole is very big, you can fall past the black hole without feeling very big tidal forces that would spaghettify you. So if our whole universe had just was just inside of a very big black hole, we wouldn't be seeing any weird spaghettification happening of our universe. So technically, we could be inside a very big black hole, but it would have to be so big that we might as well not model ourselves as being inside of one anyway. Do you think there's a possibility that black holes could have been primordial, or can they only form from collapsed stars or gravitational a byproduct of the evolution of stellar life cycle? So this is not my area of expertise, but I certainly do think black holes, um, some subset of black holes have to be primordial or are most likely primordial. This means they didn't happen because of a, a star that was already a condensed bit of matter, blew up, it had gravitational collapse, and that's what compacted the, the matter tight enough to form an event horizon. It could be that it wasn't stars formed, but just everything of earlier in the universe was kind of a soup, and it could have been, it, there are fluctuations in the density of this soup at different points. And some of these density, very dense regions could have become so dense they formed black holes. And certainly, this is probably the case because if we look at the black holes at the center of all our galaxies, all the galaxies in the visible universe, they're what are called supermassive black holes. And these black holes are just so big, it would take a lot of sustained high energy accretion onto them if they first formed from a star collapse to then continue eating to get big enough to be as supermassive as they are if they hadn't been seeded uh, previously from just um, density fluctuations in, in the soup of matter earlier on in the universe. That reminds me of, of the new diet that I'm going on. Have you heard of the black hole diet, Delilah? You know, it sounds like, a, sounds like you can eat anything you want. I, I think that. Oh yeah, you just you lose weight because you just you just eat light. Oh my goodness, that's a really good one. I have to use that. That's an old one. That's an old one. I have more if you want. Um, okay, now I'm going to go into some personal questions. Would you like to go near a black hole's event horizon as a tourist? Only if it was a very big black hole, and I wouldn't get spaghettified. <laughs> right, because if you get spaghettified, don't forget Delilah, you passed away. <laughs> uh, Oh, no, I love them. I love puns. Keep them coming. <laughs>
<laughs> you look like your dad. I want to talk about your dad in a bit. But next, I want to talk about academia and being a graduate student. So you just finished up your newly minted PhD. You learned the secret handshake. We can do it now. You're going to be what's called a postdoc. Tell me about your academic world line. How did you get to where you are? Your parents are both academics. Your, your mother's a, a well-known physician. Your father's a famous professor. He's, uh, he's my, I guess he's like kind of like my ultimate boss. He's the president of the American Physical Society. He's the, uh, he's a, a big shot professor at, at my alma mater, Brown University. Um, so tell me, obviously they played a role, but you also took a, a very different tack in many ways. Um, tell me about your academic interest as a young person and then how you guided your... Yeah. So I also, uh, I will say I have a twin brother. He is um, a, um, a PhD student in my biology right now. And so when we were little, um, our parents never tried to convince us of what career we should take. They just wanted us to um, choose something where we would be able to support ourselves. Um, but even so, in our household, given just what they study, there was always a lot of, of kind of math and, and exploration, um, but it happened through games. Um, so we used to have fun counting games, adding and subtracting rubber ducks in the tub, or we learned to divide because we were twins and we wanted to divide everything evenly. So we would divide purposely. My father would, or mother would put, um, an odd number of breakfast sausages. And so we would have to think about how to divide them so that everyone who was eating could have equal amounts of food. Um, and so from a young age, math was always kind of this fun kind of little game. And then we also used to play with different things. Like I remember when we figured out you could bounce light off of mirrors um, by just shining flashlights and playing with the reflective toys we had in our rooms. And then we, uh, you know, would be so excited. We would call our parents over and show them what we'd figured out. So it was, started off as just fun and games. Um, and I always enjoyed it, science and math, even in high school. Um, but in high school, I wasn't exactly sure what I wanted to do. There was, I liked music as well. I played clarinet. And then of the kind of science and math, I really enjoyed chemistry. What I enjoyed about chemistry was when we would talk about the structure of atoms. And what I, when I learned that they weren't these, the just Newtonian model where the electrons are just on these toy little bound orbits, but instead had these clouds, people told me to understand that mathematically what you needed was quantum mechanics. And so it was at the end of high school that I decided chemistry, uh, chemistry slash physics or music. Uh, when I was trying to decide a major, I went with physics because I figured I could play. I was not an amazing musician and I could play music uh, habitual, as a hobby, but I couldn't do the same with physics. So that's kind of what I wanted to go into in college. And it, as I took my classes, it was really getting more and more into the world of the small and the structure of particles and things like this that really got my interest. And so I really started to go down the route of particle physics, and I picked up a, a, a double major in math. And then I came to graduate school, and I was kind of trying to figure out what I wanted to do, and I did a couple rotations. So I knew I wanted to do kind of probably high energy theory, thinking about particles, and in fact, I do think about light, but I also think now about gravity um, and these giants, black holes. Um, and so what led me to really that was I took a detour from just high energy physics and did a couple rotations. One I did in astrophysics and one I did in cosmology. And it was really these that informed what I wanted to do within the high energy theory realm of study um, that led me to uh, what I do now. It's a nice marriage between uh, thinking about particles and using the really nitty gritty of the analytical mathematical to describe things that are relevant to observation in, in these giants of our universe. Yeah, it's kind of amazing that the smallest things in the universe influence the largest things in the universe. And, and conversely, you can learn about the smallest things in the universe from the largest things in the universe. Did you, besides your parents, obviously, one of whom I've had on the show, and I want to have your brother on the show, we've had on, uh, I think I've had on, you know, six or seven parents of twins. I'm a parent of boy, girl, twins. I think you're the first uh, twin that I've had on. Twins are great because you can do experiments with Einstein, you know, twin paradox, etc. cetera. Uh, but I do want to have on uh, your brother at some point. It it's cool that you beat him to the PhD. All right, at, at, you're older than him, I forgot. By one minute. <laughs> Great, great. Yeah, my son, uh, my twin boy is older than my uh, twin girl by 15 minutes, but a really uh, brilliant man uh, by the name of Sylvester James Gates told me uh, once he said Einstein wasn't always Einstein. And it, it, I, I use that 
line on a man by the name of Barry Barish, who knows a thing or two about black holes. And he told me an interesting story about Einstein. He said, when he went up to accept his Nobel Prize in 2017, you have to sign this register, this logbook that says, I got my Nobel Prize from the King of Sweden. And, and he said, I'm kind of curious. So he, he wanted to see who else signed the book. So he looked back and he saw Richard Feynman. Wow. Holy cow. There's Richard Feynman's name. He saw Marie Gephardt Mayer. Her name is in there. Uh, Marie, and he saw, he saw Albert Einstein. And he said, um, I never felt like I had imposter syndrome more than that moment. And I said, wow, that's amazing. You know, you, you probably felt, don't feel it anymore. He goes, no, I feel it even more than ever. And I said, you win the Nobel prize. You still feel that. He said, I didn't feel worthy. And, and, and I said, well, Barry, don't you feel like even Albert Einstein felt that way? And, and your dad even said that your dad said, you know, Einstein wasn't always Einstein. And if you make this notion that only Einsteins can do science, then we're going to eliminate the next Einsteins. And, and I think that would be a great tragedy. So I, I love this idea of self-care and, and, and actually just making time that we're not what we do. And, and despite these kind of notions that we're just like supposed to be these, just like we get everything right. Everybody's got imposter syndrome. That's the dirty little secret. <laughs> and, and we have to, we have to recognize that we are unique and we all have a gift and we all have something to give. So uh, speaking of, of your dad, speaking of Einstein, you know, he wrote a book, you know, Proving Einstein Right uh, with with his co-author, Kathy, and uh, we had him on the show for that and had him on uh, also last summer. He's a, he's a frequent guest. Uh, I, I want to say he's been a huge influence on me and many scientists around the world. Father's Day is coming up. I wonder, do you have any uh, anything you'd like to say to him on this Father's Day occasion? Of course. Um, so we had a, my dad and I had a great time hanging out during the pandemic. So I just want to say, you know, thanks for taking me in during the pandemic, dad. It was so much fun to hang out with you. Um, happy Father's Day. And I can't wait till we can get together next. <laughs> well, the uh, as Newton said, the you know the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. The the, the black holes don't don't orbit too far around from the event horizon. I don't know. I'm just making that up. You know what they say about you know people that that study black holes. They have to be pretty bright. Uh, I'm not that bright, so I couldn't study them. Uh, but but Delilah, you are a delight, and uh, and I wish you such good luck. I hope I can uh, see you again in person. Uh, we haven't been together in a couple of years since uh, since 2019, but I'll, I'll hopefully be in Princeton uh, and see you on the East Coast uh, many times in the future. I can't wait to see uh, where the career, where your career goes. It's just so exciting to see uh, someone so creative, inventive, and working so hard on the forefront of the most important problems in science, in, in my opinion. So thank you so much for going into the impossible with me uh, today, Delilah. Have a, have a wonderful rest of your summer and good luck. And, and make sure you rejuvenate and recharge your batteries uh, for what's to come. Thank you for having me. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. If you enjoy this video, click here and come along on a ride to the center of a black hole with Gen 11 Black Hole Survival Guide. And for an experimentalist take, you won't want to miss my interview with 2017 Nobel Prize winner Barry Barish. Just click here. And don't forget to subscribe to this channel for more great interviews.